Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy any investment based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research. Hello and welcome to the Sunday Roast. It's Sunday the 7th of July. I'm Phil Carroll. And I'm Kevin Wallsby. First roast under a Labour government, Kev. Let's see what changes are afoot. Not very much. As I, I, my, my quote in one of the groups was that we now have a Labour government in a conservative majority country. Yeah. So, so let's, the first, let's the first see how it all post, goes. That's the first past the post model, isn't it? It doesn't necessarily come down to the number of actual votes, right? Yeah, the number of actual votes, if you, I mean, you can't believe that there are that many Labour or even Lib Dem voters that would have voted for four. So if you had reform and conservative votes together, then effectively they would have been far higher than uh, than the, the Labour votes. So yeah, yeah. So obviously we we saw Rishi Sunak come out in the morning on Friday, resigning. He said he was going to resign as, as a Conservative Party leader after the crushing election defeat. He said, "I have heard your anger, disappointment, and I take responsibility for this loss." So, I mean, do you think he he's he's going to be thinking? Was I crazy to call the election early on, on the 4th of July? No man would have made a scrap of difference to be honest. The public had made their mind up. They were not going to have another Conservative government. That was the end of it. So, But if you actually look at the numbers, because we do have the first-past-the-post situation, it's, it's really quite bizarre. You know, you look at Labour with 9,686,000 uh, votes, 33.7% share of the, the vote. So a third of the country votes for Labour. Or not even a third of the country. A third of the country who voted voted who voted. for Labour. 23.7% yeah. vote Conservative. And they got 121 seats. 12.2% for Liberal Democrats. And 3.5 million votes. And they got 71 seats. Now this is the shocker. Reform... Four million voted for them, so more than the Liberal Democrats. Fourteen point three percent of the vote, and they got four seats. Yeah, that's the great. And Lib Dem got seventy-one seats. Yeah. So, what does that tell you? Reform basically took the Conservative votes. The Conservative votes plus Reform votes would have been nearly eleven million, and that would have probably given them a majority in the party. And that's what's happened. There hasn't been a landslide for Labour. Yeah. Everybody came out and voted Labour. No way, that's not what has happened. So, yeah, let's see what happens. We've got four to five years now of Labour government. And, uh, yeah, they haven't got any money. They're saying they're not going to spend more money. That, that's the mad thing. I sent I send this to my daddy. He's, I, you know, effectively, I saw it as an apathy vote from, from, you know, the majority. You know, sick of the self-serving government that have just seemed to have just almost destroyed the economy. And a lot of this does stem from Liz Truss's mini budget, which genuinely crashed the economy, caused all these, you know, high interest rates and all the, the, the you know, the fallout we've seen. And, and it, is, it is an apathy vote. It's a, it's a vote for change. But I don't think there's going to be a change under Labour. We've said it all along. I mean, you know, the, it, the fact of the money is there's no money in the coffers. So how can it, how can anything change? But the only, the only difference is that we're not going to be run by private school boys because that's yeah. basically what's been happening. Yeah. You know, the, the Conservative class has been run by, by Eden or Harrod or... or yeah. um, Arrow or whatever you want to call it, for yeah, the last absolutely. couple of decades. That, yeah. That's the reality of the situation. Uh, and now, Keir Starmer, be, being, being a human rights lawyer, human rights lawyer, you'd think that if anyone can do it right, if he can't do it, then who can? Yeah. Well, let's just hope, let's just hope that he takes a sensible route, doesn't change too much initially, sees how things go. Because I think... You know, the UK is on the right lines, probably moving towards slightly lower interest rates over the next six months if you no know, crazy stuff happens. And, yeah. you know, that, that could underpin him being able to possibly spend a bit more money on things that need more money spending on. But it, but it brings us round to our first guest, who I actually believe the Labour government is going to be extremely helpful for this company. So, yeah, there you go. So let's move on to our first guest this week. We're thrilled to introduce Adam Bin, CEO, and Derek Bickerstaff, chairman of a One Health Group PLC listed on Aquas with ticker OHGR. 
One Health has reported impressive revenues of 23.3 million for the year ended 31st of March 2024 and is making significant strides with the launch of their new surgical hubs. Let's dive in and learn more about their journey and future plans. Welcome, gents. Thank you. Hi. Absolutely. So, I mean, let's begin with it with an overview of One Health's business model and, and the kind of services you provide, particularly in terms of driving growth and supporting NHS waiting list reductions through this patient choice. Adam, maybe place, take us through the, the way One Health works. Imagine I'm a patient, you know, visiting my GP and know about this patient choice, and I'm sort of asking to be referred to One Health. Yeah, no problem. So the vast majority of our business is derived from patient referrals at the GP. So this is through a system called Patient Choice. It's been in place for many, many years, not particularly well known, but in theory, every patient visiting a GP needing subsequent investigations or a consultation should be offered a choice. Now, that choice should include a number of NHS facilities, so local and further afield, but also, importantly, independent providers, of which One Health is one. So, for example, if a patient needs their knee looking at, they've got a painful knee, the GP should offer them a consultation with One Health Group in a local clinic, and I'll explain how each clinic's in due course, where they'll meet one of our consultants for the first time. Should surgery then be required, we will then place that patient into a local independent hospital, of which we use eight and we would carry out the operation. The vast majority of patients don't need operations, I might add. They can be treated by the consultant with conservative care, but we then manage that care pathway until the patient's discharged either way. So patient choice is how we receive patients. In terms of the average clinics, we have 35 at the moment in multiple regions across Lincolnshire, Yorkshire, down the south into South Derbyshire, into Leicestershire. And that's the first point of contact with the patient, and our consultant will travel out to meet the patient in those locations as the first point of contact. So it's very local. Importantly, all activities paid for by the NHS, this is totally free to the patient. So our USPs are really, are we're fast, we're free, and we're local. And when I say fast, I'm referring to the treatment times. So we're now back to pre-pandemic levels of treatment. We see most patients from GP referral to a consultation in two to three weeks. And should surgery be required, depending on, on which specialty that is, it could be within six to eight weeks done and then discharge back to good health or physiotherapy if required. That's kind of the, the way the model works. All consultants are NHS substantive. We don't employ any. We effectively buy their spare time. They have contractual rights to sell that time as NHS consultants. So we buy that time, the same as the need exists. We buy space in independent hospitals and we rent space in outreach clinics. So fully subcontracted. The only employed workforce is the administration team, the head office here in Sheffield, who have managed who have missed the whole relationship in all those different stakeholders. Okay, so it's effectively like a, a way for a patient to to almost access a reduced waiting times, which is obviously a big issue because they might end up having a two-year wait for an operation or something, and also almost access private surgeons. Is that right? Is that, is, do you have agreements with surgeons who are effectively working for private healthcare? They're working for private health. Can we call it independent rather than private? Because I think private gives the indication that there's cost to patient involved, and there isn't in this case. So the, the, as I mentioned before, the consultants are all NHS substantives. They've got full-time NHS roles. Within the NHS contract, which Derek will explain in more detail in the next clinician uh, at, at some point, they have the right to sell some of that working week. And it's been in, 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 that's been the case since it was established. So we effectively buy that time, but they're, they're full-time NHS consultants. We pay them. The NHS pays us, but there's no charge to patient, unfortunately. And just on that referral thing, because there's a system, it's a bit like a Google search called ERS, or the GP surgery. So theoretically, the patient with the GP or the receptionist will log on to see who's available. One Health always features really highly on that, just locality and speed of service. And that's how we attract the patient. It's almost like a Google search with the GP. Hi, gentlemen. So is there a, a part of the business that is robust than another? So in other words, I would imagine, and this is obviously my opinion, that there isn't any shortage of patients looking at the waiting lists. I'd like to know, though you get the contract sorted out with the surgeons, how available is that to be increased so that this model can, can go up? And what is the availability of the places that you actually do the surgery? Yeah, as you say, loads of patients. Waiting lists at 7.7, 7.8 million, and that's something that uh, the new administration are going to need to and want to uh, deal with as soon as possible. Uh, so in plenty of patients, surgeons, there are lots and lots and lots of surgeons, as you will understand, in the UK. And as Adam says, they have full-time substantive NHS posts, but they can in their spare time work for us. 
So the areas where we work principally are underprivileged areas. We work in areas where there is not a lot of money, therefore there is not a lot of private practice, and the independent sector hospitals where we work have plenty of spare capacity. So we don't find it difficult to recruit surgeons. I think we I think we brought another 12 or 15 surgeons on this year. We've got another 20 in the pipeline. As we've grown and our geography has grown, we we come across more surgeons and increasingly surgeons are asking to join us. But we're very picky, we're very choosy, they have to be subspecialist trained and more importantly they need to buy into the ethos of One Health which is taking care out into the community. And they have to work with us with that. We don't want them sat in their ivory towers waiting for people to come to them. We've, we've flipped it so that we go out to the community. So we are not struggling to find like-minded surgeons who, who want to work with us. And fundamentally, uh, the business model works for them. Surgeons like seeing patients. So what we do is we fill their clinics and we fill their operating lists and they are very happy. We do all their administration. The only thing we, uh, we ask of them is that they comply to our clinical governance. And we have very, very, very strict cl clinical governance measuring everything that these surgeons do. So we think there's plenty of plenty of surgeons for us to go out. We're not really seeing that as a problem. With regards to the actual surgical capacity, we work in eight hospitals now. We've got another two uh, coming online. Again, as our geography grows, we start picking up other hospitals that come into our sphere. And there's another hospital shortly we're going to be working with down in Coventry. And also, so, so we, we, get, we get more and more independent sector hospitals to work with us. In the area that we work, we're very good at getting increased capacity made available to us because we have such an efficient model. We can just fill the beds for the independent sector hospitals. And they don't see us as a competitor because we don't do private work. We just do NHS work. So they go after the private medical insured and self-pay and we just do NHS work. So we're an easy option for them. We work in, in a complementary fashion with them. So at, at present, we don't have any great problem finding capacity. However, there are areas we work, as I mentioned, we work in underprivileged areas where there's very poor access both to NHS and independent sector hospitals, such as in rural areas, such as North Lincolnshire, for instance. So we have identified these areas and our plan is to drop in what we call surgical hubs, which aren't hospitals, because as Adam has said, all our consultations, diagnostics and treatments are out in the periphery near the patient's home. But there are certain areas where there is the under uh, representation of surgical capacity. And so we will be building our own surgical hub, which is basically an operating theatre and beds. And we'll be doing high tariff, work which is needed for the patients on the on the NHS way to this like hip replacement knee replacement spinal surgery so our blueprint is to carry on using independent sector capacity where available but as we grow we were identifying areas of underprivilege where we want to drop our surgical hubs into place so for a financial question then the NHS pay you a fixed sum for this for these services and then subsequently you pay the surgeon the hospital and what's left over is what you guys get. Is is that, that that's correct? Yeah, it, it's, it's called mystic terms. It's called the NHS tariff. So this this tariff is uh, reissued every year. It broadly uh, reflects inflation for for a large trust. Just to be clear, we're paid the same as the trust. We're not paid any more or any less. So each procedure has a price tag effectively. Varies based on complexity. So for example, a hip replacement is around seven thousand three hundred pounds is a payment we receive for replacing a hip. As you described, we then pay the consultant, we pay the anaesthetist, we pay a share to the independent hospital that does the procedure if required, and the balance is effectively gross margin for One Health. We're also paid for consultation, so every activity we carry out has a price tag, and that price is based on this price list for the national tariff. So yeah, that's how the payments work, and again, and no charge to patients. How does this sort of reflect for a for a surgeon, if you like? Is it is it? very beneficial for him to be doing this work as opposed to uh, working within the NHS itself? I think the major difference there is we pay per procedure. The NHS is obviously a, an hourly rate or a day rate. So the NHS clearly have challenges they're working to and they're making good progress at the moment, but a lot to do. If a consultant is offered, let's say, three hip replacements, one health, and they pay three times a number, it's more lucrative for them personally than it would be to be paid an hour at the NHS. So yes, it is an attractive model. And the other thing that One Health brings is surety of demand. So don't touch on those very high numbers of patients that are waiting. 
But because we're growing year on year and attracting new patients from new areas, we've got a constant flow of patients. So it's not a spot contract or a short-term piece of work. Once you start with One Health, you've got surety of supply into the future, which is attractive as well. So this this is ultimately a patient decision. So it's not you going out and the, the NHS coming to you and saying, I want you to do this many operations. It is basically the patient choosing via what their GP or by the, the NHS, which way does it work? Through the GP. So it's at the GP consultation, they should be given that choice and they make a decision based on information provided at the time. That said, since pandemic, we have seen activity from the NHS Direct. So a number of local trusts uh, we've supported and says that they have their own internal waiting lists, which are part of the national waiting list, where patients are already set up and registered for care, but they're struggling to break down that waiting list. So they approach us directly and we've taken patients from local trusts, treated them, and then discharged them back to good health. So that's kind of a new revenue stream that's emerged since the pandemic, but 90% plus of our activity historically is through GP referrals through ERS, so patient choice, yes. So you're currently sitting there with uh, revenues of £23 million pounds or thereabouts. You're a dividend-paying company with a dividend, I think it was around 3%, if, if I... If I 6.1 pence proposed for this year, total, yeah. Okay. How does this How does this grow? How does One Health grow? So there's two work streams. One is the organic growth, and since, well, this is our 20th year of business. We've grown consistently year on year, with exception of the pandemic year, which affected most businesses, obviously. But certainly, we, we are confident we're seeing 10 to 15% organic growth before anything else. The development of hubs in areas where there is no provision, be it independent or HS, is a step change. That's new capacity. We're effectively providing our own owned capacity. That will give us ballpark a £6 million uplift per hub in revenue. That's strategic growth, organic growth, 10 to 15% year on year for the past 33 or four years, COVID aside. And is the profit margin on the hubs going to be higher because you don't then have to pay part of the money out for the, uh, the facilities? Yeah, in, in very simple terms, the profit is higher because we're, we're not paying out the margin to the hospitals we use. The cost base is loosely the same, but the margin we pay for hospitals to use the facilities becomes internalized. And that's the step up in, in margin, effective gross margin. Very, very round numbers. We think it'll increase from 18 to around 30. So initial 12% gross margin once we've internalized that activity for surgical activity. You mentioned that you were obviously very northern, so not, well, not necessarily northern centric, but obviously the areas you've talked about are Lincoln, Derbyshire, and you, you alluded to potentially Coventry there, Derek. Are there any plans to move further south yeah. into some of the areas that are maybe not as wealthy? Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's, our, that's, that's the way we plan to grow. That's how our organic growth has always been, both north and south. So we're up into North Yorkshire now. So we're, not, we're going to be pushing into Teesside, into the northeast, we're down to Coventry, and we'll be moving further south of Coventry, maybe over into um, East Anglia, which is a big rural area. And then also, if you cross the Pennines, obviously Manchester, South Manchester, very rich area, but North North Lancashire, less so, Cumbria, less so. So these are the areas that we will target. I mean, you can imagine a sort of an axis, an axis, axis down the A1. You know, if we follow the A1 south, dodge around London, Kent would be good, areas of Sussex would be good, some areas of the home counties, Cornwall would be good. So that, that's, that's where we really work. Our, our clinics are generally based in more rural areas, less affluent areas. So yeah, sure. And our, our growth is, you know, we will be growing. To be honest, the biggest limitation on our growth is probably self-imposed in that, you know, we're a, you know I'm a clinician or ex clinician recently retired. We, the, the, there's lots and lots and lots of experience of medical experience in our company. And we are very, very focused on clinical governance. And it's essential that as we grow, our clinical governance grows with us so that we don't provide a service, which is in our opinion, would, would be substandard. So we don't want to just suddenly just to sort of flash bomb the whole of the UK with clinics everywhere, which we, from a clinical governance perspective will be diff difficult to control right from the very start of One Health, it's always been clinical governance first, the, the patient first. It's a very patient-centric uh, company. So yeah, we'll be growing organically, but we'll be growing organically in a sensible fashion where we can maintain good clinical governance. So so that said, why, um, not why actually, how would you position yourself as a company, as an investment to the individual? Thanks. Sounds good. I, th I think... There's kind of a, a couple of fundamentals for me. One is we, we pay dividends. I think in this current day and age, dividend payment is an attractive feature for an investor. 
I think it can demonstrate we're not a new flash in the fan. You know, 20 years we've been around now. We've grown consistently year on year. We generate a lot of cash. We're currently, pre-hub investment, a very asset-like business, so we can generate a lot of cash. And we're profitable. I think there's a lot of things there to be liked. We're not a speculative business. We're, we're well-established and we make a lot of money. Simplistically, that sounds quite brand no intent to be, but from a better perspective. <laughs> Making a lot of money this. sounds like a good option. It's, yeah. I suppose, I suppose the, the question I would ask is, from a cash flow point of view, I think you said, you didn't say on this interview, but when we talked earlier that you have over four million pounds in cash, I think. So, and, and you referenced that, that that could provide a hub. From free cash flow, how many hubs per annum, if you wanted to run, could you set up? That's going to continue to increase, obviously, as the hub comes. Yeah. It's going to give you more cash flow. So, so the plan at the moment is that with our existing funds and a small amount of bank debt, we can fund the first hub in isolation without any issues. As you mentioned, we carry £4.7 million of cash a year end. The next hub, depending on rollout rate, will require further funding, be that bank or self-generated. But certainly at this point, we, we would like to assume once a step we've established the first one, we do approximately one a year, obviously subject to finding land and right location stuff. But so the first one is funded vast majority from existing funds and free cash, yes. So based on all the numbers you've said, correct me, if that's six million pounds of revenue at thirty percent EBIT, that that basically means that without internal other stuff, you are hoping that your EBITDA is gonna make increase by about one point eight million pounds a year for the foreseeable. Is that fair to say? What once up and running at full speed, yeah, that that's where we Yeah, yeah. I mean it's not gonna happen instantaneously, but sure. let's say six, nine months in, yeah, running you're running the project and then moving on. So there is a real sort of snowball effect that could happen here in terms of kicking off cash flow and then and then obviously uh, continuing to grow. Obviously, with what you're saying as well, Derek, is that safety is imperative because you mess the safety bit up, yeah, the whole business is gone. Yeah, yeah. No, no one's going to want to trust you. Uh, I think Derek makes a very good point there, and we, we stress it a lot to investors, but this is not selling beans, you know, we're, we're treating patients and carrying out quite complex surgeries sometimes in relative terms complex. I mean, not as complex as some of the ingestors, but it's important. Safety is always balanced with commercial growth, and, and we have a very strong focus at board to the entire team on clinical safety, clinical governance is very, very important. So is the potential to move into other areas of um, of treatment? you know, other surgeries that you don't do at the minute that you could do, which would increase also as well? Or not? I think, what do you think? I, th- I think the re- reflecting on the 20 years, sorry, just <laughs> jumped in front there, but reflecting on the last 20 years, I think we've tried and tested a few. Certainly, so I might have been at One Health, we've tried a few different specialties. I think it's worth reflecting on the fact that if you look at that waiting list nationally, other than ophthalmology, which is catered for very well by many providers, those four specialties we carry out, which are spinal, orthopedic, general surgeon, gynecology, makes up the vast bulk of outsourced activity from the NHS. So I think we're well placed in terms of a demand and our supply. But over to you, Derek. Sorry. Yeah. No, you know, Adam, that's quite correct. But all I will say, however, is that, you know, the way One Health has been set up, the infrastructure, the regulatory control that we have within the company, it's like a blueprint for any specialist area. So it could be more surgery. It could be medical. Because the only thing that we would need to add in, again, this is going back to clinical governance, is when we took up, take on another speciality, then we need those surgeons or those physicians to come in with us, develop our clinical governance program. Because the setting up of clinics, the booking of operating, the regulatory infrastructure, working with the CQC, working with the NHS, et cetera, et cetera, all that is there. So plugging in a different speciality would be relatively straightforward for us. So it really depends on what the demand is from the NHS. At the at the minute, the NHS wants us to do orthopedic, spine, general and gynae. But if, the, if there are other pinch points that they would wish us to do, and it may be that in certain locations like down in the home counties, they have certain pressures up in Teesside, they have different pressures. If they wanted us to, we could add those, those uh, specialities. But for the time being... Given the waiting list where they are and the specialities that we do accounts for about 80% of that waiting list, that's our primary focus. Yeah, that's interesting. 80% of the, um, the waiting list is what, is what you do in terms yeah, of safety. Take some of the strain away from that as, as much as yeah. you can. Really. What, what about um, the hubs being able to have some sort of uh, 
GP available at those places in terms of, you know, you're saying the less privileged areas. Is yeah. That, is that something that is, is a possibility? Yeah. And do, do you know, way back at, at, at we, we, with the last Labour administration, there was something called the Dar- Darcy was a surgeon, a very, very well known, very renowned surgeon who was brought on by Gordon Brown to develop a, a different concept of doing things. And, and, and they tried to promote these health centres, which is basically getting GPs, pharmacists, physios, dentists, and you could, for instance, have surgical hubs to get them incorporated. And that was a push that they made then, I think, post the financial crash and there was less money available. I think that sort of fell away. But interestingly, where Streeting has just done a tour of Australia, which is a, one of the um, principal ways they manage their primary care in Australia. And I think he's minded again to see if that could be reintroduced again into this country. So us combining our hub with other other medical specialities, I think would be a great idea. I mean, already we were... We, we didn't get it through planning, but our original hub, we were going to have it with a nursing home and there was a pharmacist around the corner. You know, So in a way, this is a, a first push as a small type of health community. And I think that's a great idea. And it's something that if partners wanted to come in with that, if other people wanted to, or if the government, that was something that was government policy, then we'd be very, very minded to work with them. Yeah, I'm just thinking it's, it's, a, it's a straight referral, isn't it? Oh, by the way, the guy next door does this stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know recommend and then and then you'll have everything in the community which which ultimately is is maybe how the nhs worked the best before it became this yeah mammoth institution that it's become yeah i mean i'm always used to i mean i'm 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 a retired surgeon now when i was first appointed my appointment was not to a hospital i was appointed to sheffield area health authority so i was appointed to a community and then things evolved and then you you know you, you end up with hospital appointments whereas what one health does is we try and flip it. So our surgeons work in communities. They work in a number of hospitals. They work from a number of clinics. And my personal view is I think this is how, this is one way that we should be reforming how we manage our health service. And I think the new administration want to do more work in the community and take it out to the community, a lot more preventative type work. And I think that's, you know, it's, I think that's excellent. It's, it's exactly as it should be. So... A surgeon doesn't work for a hospital. A surgeon's responsibility is to a community. Yeah, it sounds like it makes a lot of sense, to be honest, a lot of sense. Very good. Well, it looks like you've got a business. Obviously, it's now listed. It's on the Aquas. And, uh, you know, the, the scenario is you've got 20 years of experience. This is a fly-by-night business. It's going to fall apart tomorrow. So from that perspective, you've got certainly from these cops' perspective, I see you've got quite a growth trajectory ahead of you. And I presume that's going to mean, that, Adam, that you're going to be able to be more generous with the dividends as as time goes <laughs> by. Is, that, is, is this the plan? The, the, the word we use is progressive dividend policy. I'll leave you to that. Okay, that's all very new to you. I like it. Well, you're on you're on the sun, Sunday Rose guys. So, and obviously two two northern lads. Well, what what is the, the ultimate Sunday roast, Adam? Oh wow, that's an unexpected question, but it's got to be roast pork for me every time. With a really good cracker, really good cracker. Wow. I'm a keen cook. I should have my, my background. I worked in restaurants and bars. So I'm a keen cook. So I make a pretty good Sunday roast. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Very good. Are uh, we invited? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm married to a vegetarian, but I'm allowed chicken. So uh, my, my, my <laughs> chicken roast. So, so does, never does, pork. Does, never. Does, pork. Does, the, does the wife <laughs> nut ro- a nut roast then for for you know the. She just has the veggies, but I persuaded her to have uh, goose fat roast potatoes because mine are always better than hers. So she's, she's on the edge. She's on the edge. She's on the edge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's on the edge. Very good. Very good, gentlemen. Thank you for your time. If anybody wants to know any more, I'm sure these guys are open for email or conversation with you if you want to know more about the business. But hopefully we'll be uh, keeping up to date with what you're doing over the next uh, period of time but it looks like it's a very secure investment i think i don't think there is too many big risk factors with what you're doing and really the country needs this type of stuff so let's hope it all works out for for everybody literally well, very good. thank you very much on that note we'll say adam bins and Derek bickerstaff of one health group thanks very much for your time thank, thank you. you thank you all the best thanks
So let's move on to our second guest this week. We're joined by Robin Rundle, Chairman, and Alex Danbury, CEO of Technology Minerals. Welcome back, gents. Thank you, Phil. L- literally the second time in as many days. What do we owe this pleasure? <laughs> <laughs> So obviously only joking, there's, there's lots to talk about. And we also have some questions to put to you from investors. But before we do that, let's just look at the recent announcement around Recyclers Group setting up the UK's first industrial scale discharge and dismantle unit for lithium ion batteries at its Wolverhampton site, enhancing productivity and cost efficiency. This unit will allow on-site discharge and disassembly of EV batteries, eliminating the need for third party processing. The company is also progressing with acquiring the remaining issued capital of recyclers with updates forthcoming. Inram Goni, an expert in lithium-ion battery technology, has been appointed to lead the new unit. This development supports Technology Minerals' mission to create a sustainable circular economy for battery metals. Please talk us through this discharge and dismantle news, Robin, and the, the rationale behind it, please. Yeah, sure. So it's uh, with all of these things, it's around timing. And uh, what we've experienced in the request for quotes uh, from those that wish to supply us with reasonable volumes of automotive batteries, i.e. full batteries. So batteries are coming with charge. And clearly, if they are particularly large batteries with high levels of charge in them, it can create quite a lot of heat when you put them through our process effectively. So one of the, and it slows the process down, dealing with heat clearly slows the, slows the production process down. So one of the key benefits for us is to discharge those batteries. And we can then, you know, then it's a little bit more like a, a hot knife through butter, a shredding and processing point of view. And what we're also finding is that the charging element of this is that the, 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 the science appears to be that the batteries need to be around 30% or more charged from a safety point of view for logistics. So the energy is there and it needs to be dealt with. And you may remember from releases, gosh, I would imagine around 18 months ago, that we invested early days in around about £125,000 worth of machinery to do this job of, of discharge from these batteries. But the numbers of EV batteries has been relatively low through to this point. Um, and therefore, we've been using a third party to actually do the discharge for us. So to that extent, it adds another cost into the RFQ line. And it's quite a, a rare thing to have. So those that have that capability clearly are sitting at the forefront. So we've now decided that the time is now right, looking at the numbers of EVs as they start to increase now, looking at the number of uh, requests for quotes that we're getting from OEMs as well with these large battery packs and it's helping us to be more competitive when we go out to tender and also really very much another step for us in trying to capture this energy on site so it's one more step towards getting this energy storage system on site so that we can actually run our own plant hopefully the whole site eventually from energy storage And that energy will have come from what we've recaptured from these EV batteries. So it's another step for that. For us, the final part of cost on this is that Imran has now come uh, with his final wish list, which is around about £20,000. So it's now very cost effective for us to do it. Of course, there is another head and he, by regulation, will need a second person with him. But that can be an existing trained member of staff. So we've got the cost of a head and we've got about a £20,000 bill to give him the tools that he needs to be able to do this. But to give you some idea, it's taking around £400 per battery out of the cost that we're actually able to then you know, reduce the bill to an OEM car company for during our process. So it's a significant saving when you look at it on the, on the volumes that are likely to come out of the automotive and also the insurance write-off space as well. So, sorry, quite a long answer there. Um, hopefully some of that made sense, but we believe the time is right now. We think it's making us more competitive and it's relatively, all has to be paid for, of course, but it's relatively low cost uh, to get this department up and running. And equally important is another step towards getting this on-site energy storage. But to be clear, we're not there yet with on-site storage. So 
that's something for down the road when we've got more cash in the business. Well, no, I think it's important also, we, you know, Robin's talking about the cost of this, but we'd already invested significantly in, in discharge units previously. So we've had these sitting on site now for the last, uh, the last 18 months. So they now being they now be able to be properly utilised. So it hasn't it hasn't just been this this small bit of capex. There's been sort of previous spending um, that was put in put into planning, but we hadn't at that point got into a stage where we were ready to ready to go. And just one last bit of clarification at the at the beginning, I think you said that we were the the only uh, industrial discharge unit in the country that's that's not the case what we are is the only one the only the only company offering a full service so what we can do is take the batteries discharge dissemble shred take it to black mass get the black and sell the black mass that then takes it back to so it's cradle to cradle basically and there's nobody else doing that and I think also, thanks, Alex, as well, just some of your listeners might say, well, why did we invest that money 18 months ago? And it's been, you know, it's taken this long to get going. And you may remember back then that we actually, our business strategy, when we bought those units, and they were on an, a seven-month lead time, also, uh, please don't forget, was that we were looking at doing the second uh, life element for the cells. So the the initial purpose of this was to say, look, you know, these EV batteries will come in. We can assess them cell by cell by cell. And we, providing they were around 80% of original equipment specification, we could then recertify them to go for energy storage. That whole model has turned on its head in this time frame where insurance companies are saying, do not fix lithium-ion batteries. Academia are saying and reporting into government that they now do not support Second Life and that with the advent of much, much cheaper sodium batteries for energy storage, not for automotive because they're not powerful enough, you know, there is, there, there's a big swing now that says let sodium batteries come up on the rail for energy storage and let's reuse the materials from lithium-ion batteries to make new lithium-ion batteries with because it's actually a far better use of these rare materials and difficult to get hold of materials. So that's the journey we've been on. We made a conscious decision, along with the fact that when you resell those cells, you actually suddenly become a producer, a battery producer. And that was a, a piece of legislation that was uh, you know, that, that, that has caught that system as well. And we didn't want to be out there warranting secondhand cells as a battery producer. That's not what we're here to do. So that's been a big swing, but that was the genesis behind those machines. So from the point of view of having this now, how how much more likely are the OEMs going to be to send you their batteries, for one? And for two, if they do, what are the financial implications is that going to have on? Uh, well, as as I mentioned earlier, that you know we are it's made us even more competitive when we've gone out and replied to the request for quotes, and so it's it's really putting us you know in a good place uh, to keep the cost down because you know the OEMs you know have had to work hard to get their heads round this being a cost centre for them. You know previously with things like catalytic converters and so on, they would get money for them, whereas now they've got to pay to dispose of the batteries. So anything we can do in the automotive space, and, and you know that industry has absolutely for decades been driven by cost out. So the minute we're evidencing, as we have done, that we're taking cost out of a process for them that's already painful, it's being extremely well received. And so, you know, you, you, the, these contracts are not the work of a moment. They're not fast to come to fruition but we're in the hunt with many of them and you know it's made us even more competitive as i said so you know we can only keep pushing and we have to keep looking at finding other ways of getting cost out for the oems to to continue you know making us attractive and appealing to them so as the saying goes one swallow does not make a summer but the, the scenario is how many of these batteries would you require full car batteries for the plant that to be, uh, how can we put it, you know, profitable. In other words, covering everything. How many batteries do you think per annum are required if it was just car batteries? Well, if it was just car batteries, Kevin, we've, we've we, you know, with the, one of the tenders that we've responded to is big enough in itself to justify its own plant. 
So that gives you some idea of scale. Yeah, and I think that's what I wanted to ask, really. You know, what is the quantum of these things? That if, if it's literally one comes off, what, what is then the potential? So, and is so, the potential then to put it? I mean, you, you put some stuff on social media that, you know, you're looking at another plant in Scotland. You know, a few people were saying, well, they need to get this one working before we move there. But is is it possible that one of these contracts actually says, well, why are we bringing the stuff to Wolverhampton? Why don't we build a plant next year and do it? So let's let's just uh, drill down sorry, a little bit. Sorry, that was that was five questions. No, that, that <laughs> I've, don't worry. I've summarised it to two. So so <laughs> j- just just by way of explanation, um, and what we're facing, uh, you know, on a daily basis is that the requests for quotes are coming in from automotive companies that are doing a controlled volume uh, recall program, for example, where you know they've got a batch that they want to process, and that can be a few hundred batteries. We've got others that are, you know, that, that that have got other volumes that will go into the thousands effectively. So, you know, and then we are looking at production scrap, for example, uh, as the battery companies you know, grow in numbers in the UK. So, you know, th- there are a whole range of different numbers of opportunity, Kevin. It's, it's, it's not like everybody's asking us to do X amount of volume as an average. It, it really can be, you know, it can be as low as 10 next week, but there could be literally hundreds the following month. So, okay. you know, it's it's very much a, a, a moving target. So it's very hard to give you a precise answer. So please understand there's this range out there for those reasons. Yeah, yeah. But one or two have got some fire damage material, for example, but you know, that could be 40 or 50 batteries rather than 5,000 batteries. Uh, but we can deal with those. And I think, you know, around Scotland, we made it very clear all the way through our journey that that we still believe that we are early to market just at the moment with what we're doing. And the business model that we've declared previously has been that we want to get a points of a compass effectively we think now rather than five, we can probably do it with the north, middle and south. And so that's why we've been, you know, we've been working on the Scotland thing for probably 11 months now because it involves government agencies, it involves SEPA, okay. uh, you know, the Environmental Protection, Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, a whole range of partners mm-hmm. and potential site operators that are prepared to allow this type of processing to happen you know and there's been there's been bumps in the road with that because they've had two serious fires caused by lithium ion battery storage in 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 scotland where people have literally been sitting on hundreds and in some cases perhaps a thousand odd tons of lithium ion battery and doing nothing with them because they can't process so we're having to sort of counterbalance all of these little pressure points that when just when you think you've got some really good traction going and something like that happens and the landlords that, that you're talking to suddenly get a little bit tweaky so but you know we've given a commitment that we want to do these points of the compass and as we've said it's part of our business plan you'd be disappointed with us if we weren't busy trying to find site two and potentially site three as well and you know during all of this we're also flushing out the ability to possibly co-locate with battery manufacturers with car companies where they've got a need as well so yeah, that all that good stuff is going on for plant two. And, you know, plant two isn't just going to be a cut and paste of what we've got because there's lessons learned, you know, and we've also got a mind towards some draft European 2030 regulations where ideally they'd like us to be able to process, if you like, in a clean room. And so, you know, that, that's a, a step away from where we are. But our team are already... Um, well on with the designs on CAD to actually see how we might even be able to achieve sooner than later those 2030 regulations because that's going to really strengthen our position as we talk to OEMs and gigafactories about working with them. So Robin, is it safe to say that for now, anyway, for cash flow purposes and every other purpose that the lead acid battery run there is is mothballed for now, all the cash has to go to the lithium ion side until further notice that will be the case. I think that's a very good summary, Kevin. And the answer, simple answer is yes. Great. Right. Let's move on to the uh, the RTO. Um, yeah. I mean, I just wanted to talk quickly about that because obviously mindful of time, but really just, uh, I think you've talked about in past the prospectus and obviously like revisions and alterations and submitting and waiting. So just give us an update on the sort of frustrations and challenges of getting the RTO completed. 
it's the long and short of it is it's a complicated process and you never know what's coming back. So, you know, you can think you're at the end of the list of questions and you return it and more questions spring up. So uh, none of them incredibly complicated. Uh, they're all answerable. But, you know, as it goes through through the process, inevitably other things will crop up and we answer them to the best of our ability and it goes back. I think um, at this point, it's very hard to put a firm timeline on what we're trying to do. We have tried that and it hasn't gone where we wanted it to. But all I can say is we are progressing and I think the most important thing to reiterate here is our commitment to get these two businesses consolidated uh, and merged. And I think that's that's really, really important for the shareholders to understand that we are committed to doing it. Both boards are. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, one of the other questions was, if alternative funding can be arranged, can the previously drawn down monies be repaid before conversion? I think the simple answer to that is, is yes. It would take a an agreement with the funders, but I am pretty sure that that can, can be arranged, yes. And we are, as you'd imagine, constantly looking towards other sources of finance where, you know, the, the financing we've got in place at the moment has been incredibly helpful. And but we do realize in, 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 some, in some ways it has its limitations. And, you know, we are trying to deliver as a business and on the back of that, raise capital in a, uh, in, in a more efficient manner. Okay. Another one that come in was uh, related to progress being made on the processing of vapes, uh, considering the large gate fees associated with them. Uh, yeah, this is an ongoing conversation with the environmental agency. They're keen. We are keen. We are developing a second line for this. It's not the work of a moment. You know, vapes, we waste. We, we've applied to get a code changed so that we can accept that. But also then we need to be able to deal with the nicotine as well. This is a process we understand how to do and we'd, we've developed a process for it. So it is it is something we have as a work in progress, but it will take a little more time. And Robin, I, I want to ask you also about the, uh, sorry for saying that like this, but the, the Ben Lorry project, obviously it's not a Ben Lorry, but a, a mobile recycling unit, which is probably going to look like Ben Lorry. Row, row now. It's what? A row, row. A row, row, that's what it's called. Well, like a, a tuk tuk. No, 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 no. So it's ro roll on, roll off. So where, where are we at? Oh, yeah, fine. Sorry. Uh, so, yes, it's, uh, you, you know, it's a 36 month program. It's 1.96 million from uh, Innovate. It's progressing on schedule. It's nine months in. And we, as a result of the work that we've done reviewing our opportunities in India, and I think there's a short video coming out about that probably today or Monday. Uh, on our socials, that clearly our vision was to build it on an electric lorry. But looking at some of the continents that the unit could be used on, it's been strongly recommended now by the technical team that we convert it, if you like, to a, a container style that can go onto any type of lorry with a, an A-frame where they can just literally come and pick it up and move it. Um, and even talking to automotive and insurance here in the UK, they felt that actually that might be a better solution. So the only slight change is that rather than a, a full EV carrying EV battery shredding capability, it's now going to be containerized uh, for the reasons that I've just described. But certainly, you know, still a huge amount of interest. Clear on exactly what the business model is for that yet? No. Have we put that in any of our figures and forecasts? No, we haven't. So we're not relying on it in any way. And, you know, as we get nearer to having the demo unit running, then we would expect to open discussions with those parties that are interested in being involved in, in you know, in the commercial rollout of that product. Yeah. Okay, so let's hope the next catalyst is you finalize the lithium in Leinster and, uh, and get the financial back in into the company for, for this. You've obviously got a lot of irons in the fire. Excuse the word fire there, and that should, should not use that phrase. Maybe you know, a lot of a lot of irons in the water. Oh, she's she's not lit water the irons in the fire. Kevin, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd give up. Give up. Iron in something. Okay, and uh, let's hope that all pans out. And and let's hope that we hear from you a lot more regularly in the next two to three months. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, on that note, we'll say Robin Brundle and Alex Danbury of Technology Minerals. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you for yours. Thanks very much. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the movers and shakers this week. I mean, the the big standout RNS for me this week was came from Sovereign Metals on the, on the third of July. 
they announced that Rio Tinto are going to invest an additional 18.5 Oz dollars, 18.5 million Oz dollars via the option exercise. So they're extending their position from a circa 15% to increase their shareholding to 19.76%. And we actually caught up with, with, with Sapan in the week. And I, I urge you to listen to the podcast that we put out. It's very interesting. But basically, he was saying that under Australian rules on the ASX, that once you get that the, the threshold is about 20%, you know, our threshold is, is circa 30%. 29.9. 29. 29.9. So, yeah. So, so basically, that, that their threshold is, is, nine, is just under 20%, so 19.99. Once they go over that, obviously, then they would have to make a form of it. So that's the reason why Rio have not gone above that. Because I think you asked him that question, didn't you? And he said, well, obviously, yeah. under ASX rules. So... But yeah, they're going to obviously add that to investment, that those pro proceeds will be used to continue advancing the Casia Rutile Graphite project in Malawi. Rio's further investment obviously represents another significant step towards unlocking the major new supply of low CO2 footprint natural rutile and flake graphite. And they're going to continue to provide assistance and advice on the technical and marketing aspects of Casia. So what did you make of it? Is it it's, it's a great vote of confidence, isn't it, from Rio there? Yeah, I think... I think it's one of those investments that you think, what could go wrong, you know? And I don't really see a lot go wrong here. And I think, you know, that's what they talk about when you talk about de-risking an investment. Yeah. I just see it's in that process, isn't it? It's not 100% there yet, but, you know, that that basically is what you're now investing in. Pretty de-risk program that Rio are probably going to want to buy. Charles is very much of the mind they're going to buy it, and I think I agree with them. But, you know, that's... That's basically where we're at. It's going to be a project for the ages. It's not going to be a small project the last few weeks. It's going to be there for probably 50 to 100 years in, in, in all honesty. Yeah, it's massive, isn't it? We were talking about that, that the uh, the pilot plant there and the phase of it, and it's it's, it's very large scale. But, I mean, the, the shares moved. They reacted to the news. They were up about 17% on the week. They moved to the sort of 36 pence mark, and uh, the market cap around that point was... 210 million i think we came on to valuations didn't they? they were talking about if there was a potential buyout you went in pretty concerned well you thought what was conservative around i think the half billion mark i think charles was saying potentially it should or could be higher than that obviously we have to wait and see but i think it was made pretty clear from from sapan that he or the company was still planning to take it through you know fund it capex it and actually take it through into production yeah well you sort of can't say that through the company. <laughs> He's not going to say anything different, is he? Um, because basically, what's Rio to pay as much as possible. So, uh, but the important part of that is that they are capable as a team of doing that. So that then leaves Rio in a situation that says, well, we're going to have to buy this, and if we buy it, we're going to have to pay for it. So that's basically the situation. good part from Rio is they're actually already in 20% of the stock, so they're effectively only buying 80 percent of the rest but yeah i think it's a lot of potential um there let's see where it all ends up also another one that uh, looks like something's up for sale or not looks like something for sale and is up for sale is so star resources in kazakhstan it said that they received various offers for the kubu project which is the ms copper project it's going to be in big demand as far as i'm concerned now will be worth, without doubt, in my any factors of the current market capitalization. Why it didn't respond a bit more this week, I don't know. Maybe everybody's just waiting for the actual reality. It also commented that some of the companies that have have put in bids wanted, wanted to be more involved with all of their projects, not just this one. So that that was an interesting comment that, Tried to get a comment from Alex this week, but didn't manage to get one. So, yeah, it's one that I think is going to do very well in the second half of the year. It's one that we chose last week, or I chose last week as a share that I think will probably be up by the end of this year. The next one, then, though, was Mast had some very good news regarding the fact that there was finals coming for Pybridge that we visited a while back. One of the engines has been refurbished and the other two are then in motion to be refurbished. And that's going to generate quite a lot of income, which is obviously going to put mast on a, on a, on a, on a nice uh, even keel. 
Also, Kibu has some news. So Kibu is obviously linked intrinsically. So when I did my study with the last raise that lasted, Kibu is now down to 19% shareholding. Louis Kutzer is no longer there at Kibu, another South African guy, accounting yeah, has taken so over. Basically, he's going to be, it, Louis will remain on as a consultant at this point in time, yeah. wasn't it? But they, I think they did a, was it 150,000 from Trans One Placing? Was that, is that, that was the news, wasn't it, on Friday? Yeah. And the thing to do with mass now is that, we, you know, there's a lot of people worried that Kibu was like 50, 60% shareholder at one point, but it's no longer anymore. And the market cap of mass, let's be honest, six hundred thousand pounds. How much is a main market listed shell worth today? Yeah, how would you put a value on it? But it's probably yeah, two or three times multiple. that. Yeah, absolutely. It's probably multiples of that scenario. So, if you're in for a bit of, in terms of the assets, low risk, but because of the river fort connection, in terms of the fact that river fort are in there. Now, the difference here is that River 4 are in at asset basis here this time. Yeah. So River 4 are actually the good guys. They're actually helping out here by lending the money to get Highbridge up and running. Yeah. So they're not wrecking the equity in this particular situation. They're at the asset level. So have a look at it because I think it's got some legs. It's not a short-term play, that's for sure. But if and what Peter says in the RNS, and I did have a quick chat with him, about the fact that they're hoping to move forward and, and buy another asset, which is already producing, it's going to make this a very nice play straight away, I think, if this happens. So I think there there is mileage in this, and at this valuation, definitely mileage. Definitely. There's no way they're going to, in my view, they're going to raise at 0.14 or 0.15. It would decimate it. For sure, they probably will need money at some point in the future, but... Can't see it happening now. Yeah. Next okay. one's Bazan. So you have yeah. that one? Yeah, Bazan. They, they, they obviously had announced that IDM International, to which obviously Bazan sold its interest in the Mankayan Copper Project in the Philippines, provided a shareholder update, which was copied at the low, or it was basically copied, and then there was an updated corporate presentation put onto the website, which I think was idminternational.com.au, so that's worth a look. And Bazan currently owns about 19 million IDM shares, which is approximately 23% of the issued share capital in the 2023 accounts, so circa 20 cents per share. So if you, if you do the math on that, I think you get to around... Two million pounds, which, when you look at the market cap of Bazan at two point five million or two point four million pounds, the the Mankayan investment alone is worth nearly the cap of the company. So there's some disconnect going on there. We spoke. Yeah, to Tom- we already know that the Hope and Garrup thing is is going to be the game changer. You know, the license comes. That's going to be a game changer on that company. Back to. Yeah. Having visited that place, understood it a bit more. Yeah, and they've also got they've also got the manganese as well. So they're not just a one trick pony, pony like most of you know Colin's company. So we caught up with Colin in the week as well, and we talked to him around this. We we got a, an update on a few of the Bazan things that you've talked about. Open Garb, you talked about obviously the mankind. So well worth a listen. We'll put the link in the description as well, so you can you can seek these out and anything we reference. But. Um, yeah, I, I thought that was a, a good update on there. Yeah, and then we had the Brilliant Diamonds raising some money. It's a rather distressing price, but such is life. They obviously needed the cash. The interesting thing was that I think it was well over 20% of the money raised was from directors and Professor Pinroy himself. So what does that tell you? I think it tells you that he's pretty sure that there's saw some good movement in that. I think, I think that's going to... I think we're waiting for August in Finland. But I think that could be quite a move up if yeah. that license comes in. Yeah, they've been waiting a long time for this. I mean, a few years. I think it's maybe four years. Yeah, and, and, and not just, as he said, we, we interviewed him, didn't we? I think it was a couple of weeks ago. And it, it's not just that the, the land agreement thing is important, but as he said, like the, the market really hasn't understood the latest round of of work that they've done in, in Finland uh, and, you know, with the green diamonds and the search and all those different windows and, and, and everything. I thought I thought that there was a great update on that search. Yeah, so and, and on the windows that are explained technically, it's very technical, isn't it, where you're looking for this sweet spot of where these, these elusive green diamonds are. But certainly uh, 
there's a lot going on in that company. And as you say, you visited the site. You know, there, there was the, there was the report put out that related it to various large nickel assets around you know in, in the US as well, wasn't there? So there was some really yeah. good news coming out on that on that company. Yeah. Really good news. They raised at 1.5p, which was a discount, I believe, of about 30 something percent. And it's trading now at 1.65 to 1.75, I think, which probably tells you everyone that the company's going to sell a lot uh, these sort of levels. It's got a market cap now of a couple of million pounds, probably got, you know, three to 400,000 pounds in the bank. And it'll work to be carried out in Northern Ireland, waiting for this license. And uh, I think if the license comes, then I think there's going to be some inquiries from some of the big boys because they want these green and pink diamonds, uh, big style. And this this is only one of the licenses of the diamond field that they're trying to get in Finland. So, yeah, a lot of potential upside. You know, I'll mention my friend Steve Gumba, who seems to be obsessed with this particular shirt. Some updates on a regular basis. And it's a polite way of saying that you get about 50 WhatsApp messages him on a daily basis. <laughs> yes, but he's a good lad and he's keeping me well informed. And I do I do see that there is huge potential there, I really do. And uh, it's it's one of those that uh, we were talking about this in the in that in Charles's group as well, that, you know, you talked about moonshots. This is a moonshot. You know, this is like, we all picked a moonshot. I picked African Pioneer, you picked Cobra Resources, he picked UFO. Well, I could have just as easily picked Carillion Diamonds because I think it could be a moonshot. You know, who who says Rio aren't going to come in and want to tie up the green pink diamonds even before much investigation is done? You know, the license has got maybe a bit more sampling done and then someone's going to come in and say, we'll take it from here, boys. You know, a big JV or a big buyout could easily happen, easily. And then the other thing in Northern Ireland is potentially as big, if not bigger, if it is to be compared to what this expert has compared it with in the US. So, yeah, a couple of, it's a, um, a moonshot company in terms of that, one with, that had a much higher market capitalization even in the last 12 months. So, yeah, let's see where it goes. All right. Well, let's, uh, we've talked enough about stocks there. Have you ever been to Wimbledon? Not the, not the tournament. Okay. Because it is phenomenal. I've just my, my youngest daughter went on, on the school trip. She was uh, very lucky to visit. And uh, on the Monday, the actual opening day, when the weather was good and she'd never been on centre court, she'd never been on court one, number one, and she absolutely had a phenomenal day. You know, she, and she's not massive. She plays tennis, obviously, at school. But she was blown away by how good it is. And I've been there in the past. I've been to Centre Court. I've done one. And I think it's one of the best sporting accounts. I know you like your golf and you like watching things. But you know, me, I like tennis as well. Tennis is phenomenal. And I've seen Federer play there. I've seen Djokovic play there. I've seen Nadal. I've seen Murray over the years. And it is a great sporting event. So would urge you to, to at some point, go and, you know. Yeah, it's one of those you know, bucket list things, isn't it? She goes to Wimbledon at the um, and, and, number and one. Last sport. night, I don't know if you saw the news, but Andy Murray he obviously pulled out from the tournament on this from a singles point of view because, he, he, you know, he's recently had surgery on, on all sorts of injury. I mean, the guy's falling apart, really, and it's not surprising <laughs> when you're playing. No, but when you're playing at that level, mate, of fitness, and, you know, he, he's you know, you, he's been doing it for, what, probably 20 years now or something along those lines at a professional level. And um, you know, you you look at him now, and he pl- actually played a doubles on on Thursday with his brother Jamie, and they got they got beaten on the in the first round. They, they're out, right? So they did a tribute to them. Sue Barker came out, who'd long retired from BBC, and they did a tribute to him in front of Djokovic and quite a few other players. And he was emotional, you know, the guy. He's won two. He's won the two Wimbledon's. I think first in 2013, then again in 2016. And it was just lovely to see this tribute to him. You know, finally he's he's give, given up, and that's it. And he's it was almost him coming to terms with the fact that he's never going to be playing the Grand Slam ever again. Obviously, he is going to continue playing this this year at Wimbledon. He's teaming up with Emma Raducanu, as we know. She's a you know she's an up and coming. Say up and coming. She won. Won the U.S. Open. We fact we watched that game. It's hardly up and coming, but yes. But, but she's 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 still thriving. Her career is is still you know she's still oh, in she's the early just days. begun. Yeah. So are you sure? Did he win two Wimbledon's or did he win the Olympics and he won the one? He won the 
won, he won the Olympics in 2012, and then he won Wimbledon in 13, and then he won in 2016. So he's got two, two Wimbledon tournaments for sure. Wow. I thought Which is mad, good. mad considering you know he he was up against, but yeah, and then football. Obviously, we're not going to you know turn a blind eye to the fact that England, that as you mentioned in one of the podcasts, <laughs> Jude Bellingham got the the wonder, the overhead kick, bicycle kick, however you want to refer to it. Which I don't think many people expected. There's not many that could have uh, could have had that come pulling that out the, after such a woeful performance. So here we are on Sunday. You know, England are through to the uh, to the quarterfinals. And yeah. what, what do you make of that that win over Switzerland, Kev? No, we haven't beaten Switzerland. That was a fraudulent thing that you just said. No, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm that's wishful thinking. Obviously, we're recording. Oh, it. okay, we're recording, we're recording this before. before. So that's my prediction. Well, I actually think they're going to beat Switzerland. I don't know why. I don't know how, but I think they're going to beat Switzerland. I think they've got something. What, what changes would Southgate have to affect for us to beat Switzerland, do you think? Well, he'd have to fire himself, probably, which would not be a good option at this stage of the tournament. No, we criticise him, but, I mean, he got pulled out of the fire, didn't he, really? Like, 90 seconds to go and Bellingham, header or long throw, which is exactly what we wouldn't normally do header on and bicycle kick right into the corner of the net and then Kane scores with a Tony header back across the goal, which not many people have been saying, but he put another striker on and what happens? We score another goal. He's got to be more attacking. Yeah, and he's got to it's make the change. Leaves it's too late. Change. Why doesn't he play three at the back? Stop worrying about being on balance. Play three at the back, play three, five, two, and not worry about it, right? Yeah. Three five two with the goalkeeper. He can play five across the middle. He can play Alexander Arnold on one side, Palmer on the other hand, and and maybe uh, Kane and uh, Tony up front, and then the three in midfield. Who are you going to play? You're going to play Rice, Bellingham, Foden. You know, maybe Saka's the one that misses out in that in 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 my book. In that in that scenario, you play almost a diamond in midfield with the the two hanging slightly back, and and go for it. Like go for it. I think we're, we're in the quarterfinals now. He's got to, yeah. he's got to basically attack, attack, attack. Maybe yeah. this has been his plan all along. Maybe that's exactly what he's going to do. But yeah. for me, he has to play five in midfield. Alexander Arnold and Palmer across the across with with the Rice as you hold in midfield. Bellingham and Foden basically. Bellingham number eight. Foden number ten. And play Tony Kane or Watkins Kane. Or Watkins and Tony up from that's my view. No, I agree. I, I think you, you he know, won't you, do it. He won't no, do it. He won't do it. Uh, it's like he's he's, he's he's afraid of offending the the, the 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 bigger names in that team. It's like you know he wouldn't take the, some of the players off. Um, as you said, you know, as soon as Palmer came on, he made a big difference to the game. Tony Tony did as well. So the uh, what what do you make of the the the, the Portugal game? Well, obviously, you know, Slovenia played some excellent football. They they were you know they were strong. Obviously, that one that was the first game that had gone into extra time, and other than other than England, of course, and then obviously the first game that's actually gone to penalties. So, what what did you make of the, the of the saves that the Portuguese that the Portuguese keeper made? Well, the first thing to talk about is Ronaldo crying. <laughs> and, yeah, missing and... the play. In, in extra time, he missed a penalty and started crying. Now, was he crying for Portugal or was he crying for himself? This is the issue. And this is why everybody who's criticising him, we wanted to criticise him. I don't know. I think he gets a bit of a bad rap, but at the same time, give me Messi every time. Yeah. But that that aside, yeah, the Portuguese keeper, I don't think, has anyone ever saved the first three penalties? I don't, I don't know. I don't think but, done, uh, I don't uh, remarkable, really. Only three penalties required. And Portugal scored them all, so so they're going through. Yes. So we're in the quarterfinals now. We're probably going to have maybe two more Sunday rows. Who's going to win the champ before we have the break? For the no, I mean, I'm just looking at the fixtures. Who's, so got... who's going to win? Well, we've so got we'll Spain, have... Germany tonight. So I'm going to I'm going to go for Spain to beat Germany. So they'll go through, yeah. and then we've got France, Portugal in the evening, late the later game. I'm going to go France to beat Portugal. Um, you know, France, so, Spain, semi. Yeah. I'd have to not disagree with you there. I think what's this and, 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 and I have to say, I think the winners of this are going to be, I can see France doing it again. France against Spain. No, I think Spain are going to beat France. So I think it's going to be Spain in the final against A another. And who's that A another going to be? 
Well, I'm saying England are going to beat Switzerland. And then who's the other semi final? Turkey. Turkey as well, and the, and the Netherlands, haven't you? I mean, are you going to rule out the Turkish in this? Turkey against Holland. Well, I think the I think the Dutch have got the the bit between their teeth. I think they'll beat Turkey, and then we're going to have a Holland England semi final, and then England they're going to beat Holland in the semi final because they're going to go all out attacking, and then we're going to have a Spain England final, and yeah, our hearts will be broken. So it'll be effectively the, the, a rerun of the the Italy England of the in the last Euros that we saw in the final where we Spain will be as four we have done our penalties. It's the same old, isn't it? The nearly men, but yeah. On that note, anything else you want to add? Anything else on the on the agenda for the coming week? Uh, no, not really. I mean, there's a lot happening in the US. We've got the US dollar finally giving us a bit of weakness. So Sterling's gone up a bit. Gold is looking like it's perking up. Copper certainly fell back a considerable amount from the highs of five point something to the pound or to the ten and a half thousand. But it's perked up on Friday, the three and a half percent up back to four point seven a pound, probably now around the nine five, nine six. So, you know, we're having these ups and downs in all of these, but they seem to be trading in ranges. But I think if gold breaks out, copper will break out and all of the resources will break out again. And I think that will come possibly from instability in the U.S., probably a weakening U.S. dollar. If Biden does not step aside, I think it's going to continue. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, and that's a bit more macro than what's going to happen next week. But, yeah. Yeah. So we've got two more weeks of the Sunday Roast before we take a six-week break over the summer. Yeah, we've got some interesting stuff next week. We've got two investor sort of uh, type uh, individuals who are going to be giving us their thoughts on how they invest, what they invest in, and give them their, their overall view. So please tune in for that one, because I think it should be very interesting. And then we'll have a season finale the week after mm-hmm. with some special guests. So let's see where we go from there. Yeah. So thanks for listening. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and also hit the bell icon for any f- further notifications of any future episodes. Have a great weekend all. Indeed. Come on, England. This podcast was brought to you by Roast PR Limited. If you would like to appear on a future episode of The Sunday Roast, please email admin at thesundayroast.net.